presentation today. I'll uh, introduce the panel and then we'll just get started. Uh, Jim is seated to my left. Jim Dow has been editorial page editor of the Boston Globe since 2022. He spent 30 years at the New York Times in various roles, including as deputy national editor, op-ed editor, and metro editor. Uh, during the Afghanistan war, he won an Emmy for a multimedia series on the deployment of an army battalion titled A Year at War. Next to Jim is Katie Kingsbury. Uh, Katie leads opinion at the New York Times, which she joined in 2017 as deputy editorial page editor. Uh, she directed the Times Pulitzer winning editorials on race and culture in 2019. Before the Times, she was managing editor of the Boston Globe, where she won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in editorial writing for a series on restaurant workers and the human costs of income inequality. Sitting next to Katie is Nancy Ankrum. Nancy has been the Miami Herald's editorial page editor since 2013, and she uh, has been a member of the Miami Herald editorial board since 1990, where she's covered municipal government, healthcare, education, and many other significant topics. She was the 2021 and 2022 Pulitzer Prize juror. And on the end, we have Zeba Khan. Uh, Zeba is the deputy editorial page editor for the San Francisco Chronicle. She was a senior facilitator and director of fellowships at the Op-Ed Project, a national organization that seeks to empower underrepresented voices in the national conversation. She was a 2018 John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford, uh, where we first met. So uh, let's get started. Uh, please welcome our panel. We're going to kick off with something very basic. We want to try to demystify uh, what opinion is and the editorial process a little bit. Uh, you all work for organizations with different resources and structures for opinion. Please tell us a little bit about the structure of opinion uh, in your shop. Uh, and let's get started with uh, Zeba. Okay, done. Um, so uh, we are a fairly small team. Um, we are at seven at this point. We grew to seven just recently in the last few months after being three for about a year. Um, and we focus mainly on local, which I'm happy to talk about more later. Um, what else did you ask about that? Uh, just the structure of opinion in your shop. So I just told oh, sure. so, so you have seven people. How are those divided? There sure. is an editor, a deputy editor. Yeah, so we have a head of opinion, um, Matt Fleischer, who, um, myself as the deputy, um, a managing editor, um, a, an assistant editor, and then we have three columnists. Um, I think that's, that's seven, so that's Great. how we break down. Thank you. Nancy? We blend both uh, old school and new school. Um, we have a, a board of, there are four of us on the board. We have beats. Um, government, education, healthcare. Uh, th th it's fluid though, the, those lines blur. And uh, we meet daily, uh, this is the old school part, and discuss and discuss and discuss. Uh, have a lot of fun doing it as a matter of fact. Uh, but the new school part is we also have uh, an audience growth producer dedicated to the editorial board and she makes sure that our editorials, our columns, uh, and, and op-eds are pushed out, kicked up by, say, Smart News, Yahoo, whatever, and, and bringing in the page views, bringing in the subscriptions. It's, it's, it's new for us on an, uh, on an editorial board. Oh, I have to worry about subscriptions? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, thank you very much, Katie. That's really interesting, Nancy. Um, first, I wanted to say uh, thank you all for being here. It's just so thrilling to be back at ISOJ after uh, the pandemic and to, to be in this room with you all. Um, so I oversee uh, the New York Times opinion section. I want to start a little bit about talking about um, how we do our work. So we are a collection of editors and writers and fact checkers and copy editors and audience editors audio producers, videographers, it really runs the gamut in terms of the skill sets that we have in opinion. We are trying to obviously offer a breadth of perspectives on the forces that shape our world today and to help our, what is a global audience, um, sh understand, develop their own views and ultimately kind of challenge their views in some cases. 
Um, we have about 200 people in Times Opinion spread across the globe. Uh, we are based in London, Seoul, New York, Washington DC, and San Francisco. Those are our main hubs. Uh, we have, um, of course, our columnist voices, people that you probably know well, people like Tom Friedman, Maureen Dowd, um, Brett Stevens, Ross Douthat, Jamel Bowie, Charles Blow, um, there are 19 of those folks. Uh, we have recently put in place a large newsletter operation. Uh, we also, I also oversee the institutional voice of the New York Times, our editorial board. We have um, a robust audio graphics and video. Uh, we just won our first Oscar for the New York Times, which we're very proud of. Congratulations. For, thank you for a film called The Queen of Basketball. Please watch it if you can. Um, and, um, and then we have um, our outside contributors, what we call our guest essay operation. And that is a team of editors, again, who are looking for expertise and lived experience um, from a variety of different viewpoints. And um, those are what were traditionally known as op-eds. Um, and then we have what we think of as our reader's voices, and that's letters to the editor, our comments section. We do a lot of curation of comments at this point. So uh, you joined the uh, Times, Katie, in 2017. Yes. So how has that number at changed and grown? I mean, because yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah, Yeah, we've, we've been really lucky. The, the Sulzberger family and the Times itself, um, Jim is my former colleague, and in arms on a lot of this effort, we were able to um, get a great deal of investment and to build out the opinion operation. Great, thank you. Uh, Jim, tell us about the Globe. So it's a little unfair for you to make me go after Katie. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I've been at the Globe now for about nine months, and um, I, I, having come from uh, the New York Times, I was the Metro editor there more recently, but I, wasn't, I was the op-ed editor there for a few years. and. Um, at the Globe, I thought, well, this is going to be fun. It's a very small operation. It's about 25 people. And I've since learned that that actually is pretty big for um, uh, an opinions uh, section, it, as long as you factor out the New York Times. Um, and we're, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a fairly traditional, or at least when I got there, it was a fairly traditional sort of organization. Um, there were columnists. There were columnists who wrote editorials. There were editorial writers who just wrote editorials. There's an op-ed team. There was a letter editor, and um, there was a copy editor, basically. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's rather print-focused and uh, focused on the home page. And, uh, and what um, we're trying to move towards more is, are some of the things that Nancy talked about, for instance, and also some of the things Katie's doing, although on a much smaller scale. Um, one of the first things I added was um, a social media editor, because we had just one person who was sort of doing everything related to, to, the, to um, the internet. Um, and so having someone who just would run the accounts and could think about new forms like Instagram Reels and TikTok freed up the, the other, you know, the, the person we called a, a content producer to now think about audience more broadly and how to expand audience and how to think strategically about SEO and headlines and, and, and really sort of just build out and grow our funnel. Um, so, they're a little team, but they're, they're a team now. Um, and we're, we're also uh, creating a podcast this year, and that's meant adding a part-time audio producer who will work with, we have repurposed one of our staffers to work with them on um, uh, you know, getting guests and, and doing prep work for the host, who's one of the, the Globe's columnists. Um, so, um, and we're also, uh, we haven't been able to, Add staff yet, but we hope to build out our newsletters, uh, and and you know I, I see that as a as a you know great new format for reaching a different audience niches of audiences, um, and also just engaging our, our loyal readers. So uh, we're getting you know columnists to do newsletters. Um, our my deputies writing a newsletter. Um, and uh, we may hire somebody who's just going to be focused on newsletters. So that's not quite a team, but it's, you know, it's, it's sort of reorganizing how we're structured a little bit. So, so actually, let's tease that out a little bit, uh, because uh, uh, everybody's doing newsletters in some form. So right. uh, let's talk a little bit more about the types of newsletters that you're doing, what goes into them, uh, how many you have. Uh, yeah. 
So um, there, there, when I got there, there was uh, the basic sort of RSS feed newsletter, just today in opinion, you know, and a listing of, of our, all our pieces that day. And it was not curated, and it was oddly, it wasn't oddly formatted, but it, sometimes you'd have letters at the tops, and the most important piece might be at the bottom, and it didn't quite make sense. So we've, we've turned that into a curated thing, uh, where we write a short intro, um, and then we're sort of, you know, including things more in terms of what we think is important. Usually the editorial at the top, but sometimes op-eds. Um, and the Sunday uh, ideas section is included in that, which it wasn't before. Um, we've, I've encouraged the columnists to do their own newsletters. Um, the, the, the Times has done this, I think, quite brilliantly, um, where the, the, the newsletters are just their own form of content now. They're not just a way to you know, uh, provide links to, to, our, to our pieces. Um, it, you know, I, I want them to think about it as a different type of column where they can write in a more conversational style, um, where they can talk about their dogs, their kids, their passions, you know. Uh, one of our columnists, Renee Graham, is, was a music critic and she's just, she knows everything about music and I'm just like, use your newsletter to talk a little bit about music. It can be politics and culture at the time, whatever you want it to be, but Say something about what you're listening to this week. Um, Jamel Bowie does this really well. Um, Ross, actually. Ross Douthat. He, Ross talks about film. The yeah. best newsletter he's written was about Fleischman is in Trouble, the TV show. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, terrific. Just and adds another dimension. I'll just quickly add two other things. We, you know, we, we, we want to think a little bit about pop-up newsletters, just as like attacking issues. We, we started one in the fall when the, uh, the MBTA, the T, the, subway, the, the transit system closed down for a month and we thought, well, let's just do a newsletter to help people understand what's going on. So it started out sort of newsy, but it, it was so popular um, and got so many subscribers that we, we just extended it. And now it's about all transportation in the Boston metro region, which is a, you know, people are just obsessed with, you know. So it's cars, it's, it's, it's trains, it's e-bikes, it's, it's scooters, whatever. Like we just try to talk about transit issues, and it's, it's written by our brilliant deputy um, editorial page editor who's really funny and interesting. Um, and we'll probably start a politics newsletter, is my guess, in time for the 2024 election. Um, so that's how we're thinking about those things. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, let's go to Nancy. And, yeah, uh, the, the, the Miami Herald has dozens and dozens of uh, newsletters, three of which are opinion newsletters. Um, and they are uh, by far the most popular, have the highest readership of all, all of McClatchy. Uh, we have a, uh, a conservative newsletter called Right to the Point, um, Miami, the Miami Debate, which is just you know, your general interest newsletter, and then a Spanish language newsletter that is tied to our sister paper, El Nuevo Herald. And we, each board member, and sometimes the growth producer too, we write, uh, we take, rotate and rewrite the intro. And, and as you know, James said, it, it can be personal, it can be, if you don't have the time, it can be based on an editorial that you know, you've already reported, already written, and you put whatever didn't make it into the editorial into your intro. I wrote an intro, I was writing at 3 a.m. <laughs> this morning at the airport, and you know, it's a great We've use of time. <laughs> but we do use it uh, as a topper um, to get a little more value added out of content that we've already run that week. Great, thank you. Zaiba, what uh, do you do at the Chronicle? Yeah, um, Opinion doesn't have its own newsletter, so we are part of the Chronicle's larger newsletter ecosystem, which um, usually we put out, is the main one we add our pieces to is three times a week. There are some additional ones where we occasionally um, sort of have to, you know, advocate for a piece that we really think should have a wider audience in one of the more popular newsletters. And in those cases, we're going to write a little intro as well to distinguish it from just the op-ed itself and gives behind the scenes as a, in my in one case, you know, as an editor, why we picked that piece, the process, because we want to illuminate to to the readers behind the scenes how they can actually join the conversation in their own topics. Um, I'm curious to ask a question, if I can, to Jim, because I'm thinking about this, we talked about this last night, about limited resources, and, and one of the bandwidth issues for establishing a newsletter is that it, it takes significant bandwidth, potentially, um, but that you've found that you can use some of the uh, op-eds and repurpose them so they actually then, or the content goes behind the subscriber wall as well. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I try not to, you know, underplay the amount of work that goes into these things because everybody ends up doing five different things. Um, but we we do. I, I th this may I may be proven wrong about this, but um, I mean we talked about this at the Times. It's like I sense that there's different types of audiences for all these things, and so like if you repurpose things, you're not really people aren't seeing it twice by and large. So I've encouraged the the, the columnists to think like. You know, if you write a great, you know, lengthy top to your, your newsletter, that, that can be your column in the paper tomorrow. It doesn't, and, and we'll, we will take it and republish it just as, you know, as a column behind the paywall. Um, and the newsletter is going out free to all kinds of people, some of whom are subscribers and many of whom are not. And they, they all can see it. Um, and so if we're getting double, triple, you know, ways to get it out there, then that, that's fine by me. Um, and you know, uh, you know, if 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 you you don't have to write two columns in the newsletter that week because you're writing one of your columns is going to be off your newsletter. Take that time to write a bigger, you know, work on that project you want to work on uh, instead. And so that's how I'm trying to encourage people to think about it. Great, thank you, Katie. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I I can't even begin to imagine. Actually, I probably get a fraction of the newsletters that you offer. Yeah, we have, we have many newsletters at the New York Times, including an opinion. We have changed our thinking at the Times a little bit around newsletters in recent years. You've probably seen uh, over the last year and a half or so, we have created what we call our portfolio of subscriber-only newsletters. Um, and that is really an effort, you know, we've gotten at the Times pretty good at growing subscriptions, but um, what we find newsletters are a really great tool at is retaining subscribers. And so we have presented newsletters as a um, an added value proposition for being a subscriber to the New York Times. And so we have several newsletters that you can get for free. Those include things like uh, our Opinion Today newsletter, which we have about a million subscribers to at this point. And that is um, something that we use, frankly, to talk very similarly to how others have described it on the stage about the work we're doing in opinion, why we're making the choices that we are, um, why are we choosing the voices to present those kinds of things on a daily basis. And then we have what we think of as our voice here newsletters that are coming from an individual writer that people are developing habits with. To my mind, newsletters have been really exciting for a couple of reasons. Um, that you might not realize. The first of which is that it's allowed us to really experiment with form. I think we actually have a slide. Uh, sorry, I'm a slide person. Uh, so um, our, my third slide, um, uh, you can see, but one of the things that we've done is, for instance, invite novelists like Sheila Hetty to do an entirely different form of writing uh, in opinion. You guys don't have to figure out that slide. It's not that interesting, I promise. Um, and then um, simultaneously, we have, oh, here's a clicker. Wow, you guys gave me a clicker? That's very exciting. I don't know if you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, so these are our news, this is a, a, a group of our newsletters. Opinion Today, as I was mentioning, is our daily newsletter. Then we have, um, at the end, the Sheila Hetty newsletter. And essentially, it was using fiction in opinion writing, which is a new form for us. And then, again, it allows our newsletter writers to, uh, or excuse me, our columnists to be a little bit more casual in their writing. People like Jamel Bowie, who write about movies and recipes and all those fun things. And, and all of that is to build a deeper loyalty with our signature voices in opinion and hopefully have people continually come back and find their work. Uh, thanks, Katie. So um, you've all hinted at various aspects of this. Uh, for the prior two days, API has been having a summit on opinion uh, that several people on the stage attended. And one of the things we kicked off that summit by talking about was whether or not opinion at news organizations had mission statements, uh, uh, and if those mission statements were publicly understood. So uh, I'll turn to the panel and say, uh, do you have mission statements, and how do you communicate those to the public? We don't have a mission statement. I never thought of having a mission statement. I must say, I think there are, I, I think generally, among our readership, younger readers, readers don't exactly know what we do. Um, they read us, but 
they will submit what I can, what an op-ed and call it, here's my editorial. Um, someone will say, well, you know, that Leonard Pitts column who, who has retired, uh, um, well, that, that was just so opinionated. He's supposed to be objective. Well, no, do this. You know, <laughs> you, that, that's not what it is. Uh, but no, we don't have a mission statement, should we? Well, uh, uh, that's a fair question, right? <laughs> I mean, so how do you explain to people what you do? You know, we, we also don't have uh, a mission statement that we talk about publicly yeah. Um, yeah. with an external audience, except for in forums like this, right, um, where we're talking about right. our work. Um, and of course, uh, more broadly. I'm curious, do you have a mission statement, Jim? So this, this is very funny. Do you want me to uh, jump in here? Um, <laughs> so Michael asked me this, uh, sort of the folks at API a few weeks ago, and I said, no, we don't have a mission statement. And then I went back and talked to our, my deputy, and she said, yeah, we have a mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, we it's, talk about, a, you know, we have, we have a, um, we have a set of values that dictate a lot of the work of the editorial board, which is publicly on our website that we talk about. But we do, I don't know, and I'm, I'm curious about others as well. I mean, we do talk a lot about what our mission is yeah. in Time's opinion amongst ourselves on our staff. Um, and you know that has changed in recent years, but I think it has been very helpful for us for, to really articulate what we're trying to do every day and have those principles, particularly when and I'm sure everyone on the stage has had these moments uh, of controversy and you know, being able to determine signal from noise, um, it often helps to go back to those guiding principles which we have discussed in the past. Zayba? Yeah, similarly, we don't have a mission statement formulated, but I think amongst our, our team, we've talked about what matters to us and what are the goals of the opinion page, and that sort of is our, our guiding compass for how we seek out uh, external contributors, how we look at pieces that come in that, like Katie was mentioning, may be lightning rod moments and sort of delineate what makes sense to have on the page and what doesn't. Um, but it was a great question to be asked and then realize, no, we don't. <laughs> Can I just add, now mm. that I'm thinking about it, we don't have a mission statement, but we are mission driven. Mm. And we are mission driven, especially as we approach um, 2024 and the presidential election. And we have talked and will continue to talk about how we are going to opine about, about it. We have given up, if you're following what's happening in Florida from the governor's mansion, from the legislature, we, we do not delude ourselves. We, unlike previous administrations, we do not write editorials about, about the, the intolerance and the uh, autocratic tendencies thinking we're going to change something. No. What we are, our mission here is to introduce our governor, who will likely announce for president soon, mm -hmm. um, to the rest of the country. This, this is, this is um, who you're getting. This is what he's doing. Pay attention. Can I add one thing? Oh, please, go ahead. Um, I'll just say that, you know, in the, in the in the, whatever the two weeks where I didn't think we had a mission statement, and I was like busily like trying to write one, and I was like, "This is really hard." Um, but it was well. Like, we wanted you to do it in nine words, and so. you wanted to do it in nine words, which was. And as I discovered, our actual mission statement is about forty words, so uh, it would have failed that test. But it, but just the exercise of thinking about it really, I think, was really fantastic. It it really helped me just sort of crystallize thoughts. And even though what I came up with was probably even longer, about 60 words, um, it did make me, force me to sort of like think about priorities for the department, how, just how I think about it and how I think my colleagues think about it. Um, some of which could be outward facing, but a lot of it could be very, as Katie said, you know, just really useful for us to think about our priorities, how we do our budget even, how we should think about submissions and that sort of thing, so. But I do think just adding to that, there's value in communicating some version of it to the public. For us, there's a lot of what Nancy said, confusion about what we do and how we delineate what an op-ed is. We have op-ed submissions to the letter to the editor and vice versa. So um, that process in the last two days and two weeks has made me think, okay, we need to put some time into educating. Transparency, transparency for sure around what we do, but also an educational aspect um, to invite more people into that conversation, which is what we want ultimately. Yeah, we had that conversation about a year ago. Yeah, we need to do this, and we haven't done it yet. <laughs> but our intent is solid. 
So um, as you think about that and what you're doing, how does uh, opinion complement the rest of the news organization's work, right? All the articles and everything that are coming out, uh, and opinion is doing something that often touches on some of the same topics, but in a very different way. So uh, Katie, why don't you start? Sure. So um, at the Times, opinion is a completely separate operation from our newsroom. I report to our publisher, A.G. Sulzberger, as does Joe Kahn, who will be here tomorrow. Um, we do not have any coordination of editorial um, decisions, period. Um, you know, I think they're occasionally annoyed when on that rare occasion where opinion breaks news um, that they get about an hour heads up um, uh, versus the rest of the world. Um, but you know, we obviously do have, you know, we have shared resources around finance and uh, security and uh, those types of things. Um, I really think about the newsroom's job as showing how the world is and helping people understand how the world is and opinion's job being um, presenting the world as it could be and helping to contextualize and clarify the news of the day and in opinion, probably much like many of the newsrooms that uh, you all are working in, um, we really concentrate on having pieces that are responding directly off the news, um, and then um, trying to do more what we think of as signature work, work that you can only get exclusively at the New York Times. And that of course comes in the form of the 19 columnists that we have, uh, six of which we've added in the last year, because we do think that's so important for building reader loyalty. Um, and then um, we have made big investments in terms of building out our interactive um, capabilities and doing more and more collaboration across opinion. Great, oh, well, and I know at the Chronicle there's a very different sort of structure. Um, so opinion is separate from the newsroom, um, but we, uh, one of the things we've been doing recently is when we talked about this in the call is the, the Chronicle has a larger project that reimagines what our city can look like post-pandemic called SF Next. Um, that's multimedia and has been, has been developing in, in myriad ways. Um, opinion is separate from that, but there's some coordination when we've done pieces on housing and sort of how the bureaucracy of San Francisco to get anything uh, done. Um, and then there's coordination in terms of sharing that content after the fact um, and helping provide uh, larger platforms for those pieces, so we do share that. Um, but our columnists, and like this is something similar when I'm thinking off of what Katie had said, you know, for local, um, there's just a massive lack of um, information just generally, and so for us, our columnists are really excellent at digging down into different aspects of what we needed in the Bay and in California, whether that's a culture criticism of the city in, di in different ways, or we have someone focused on state uh, politics, um, as well as somebody who really is in the, in the weeds of the housing crisis um, that is the top of mind for all of us. So um, bringing those stories out, elevating um, individuals and, and that they meet in the city or at the state house, and telling those in compelling and interesting ways, we consistently cons consistently see that those pieces drive a lot of our traffic, which is just pushing the idea and confirming the idea that I think many people in local news know that the, the more local you are, the, the more you're me meeting a need of your, your audience, your readership, and your city. Okay, Nancy? Um, we are separate from the newsroom, independent of the newsroom. However, we talk to the newsroom. We don't coordinate. We do like to know what's on their budget. And the newsroom actually, newsroom leaders have complimented us over the last few years for being out ahead, doing quicker turnarounds than, you know, everyone has a bandwidth problem, mm -hmm. including the newsroom. Um, you know, I'm reminded of, you asked what does the, what do the opinion pages add um, when, when I, when my husband and I got off of the plane today, this morning, um, first thing I saw a man on the escalator in front of us and his t-shirt said, the only deadly virus in this country is the media. Oh, we took a wow. picture. <laughs> I, I, I thought, should I give him my card and say, let's talk, let's talk. But, but I, have had to, I have had to sharpen my 
and refine my response to people who don't trust us, who say, who come to me and say, don't tell me what to think. And my response is, we're not telling you what to think. We're not telling you what to think. We're, we're telling you what to consider. What else to factor into your thinking about an issue, a candidate? Because we do the, 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 um, the, the shoe leather journalism on that. We do the background checks. We do the interviewing. We get the questionnaires from them. And, you know, so if you really, we, we traffic in facts. Mm -hmm. And you can learn from that. I think that's actually one of the biggest misconceptions about opinion journalism. There is no opinion journalism that is produced by any of the newsrooms on this stage that doesn't have deep reporting behind it. Um, you know, whether it's an unsigned editorial or a column or even an op-ed, there are, um, you know, a lot of efforts that go into gathering research and reporting to back up the arguments that those writers are making. You know, I always say at the New York Times, the largest fact-checking team is in opinion. We have made great investments in that area in the last few years because we are, of course, trying to deal with some of the mistrust in media that puts an onus on us to make sure that we're as accurate as we possibly can. And so I think making, using, um, broadening the understanding of how fact-based the arguments are that we're trying to make on a day-to-day -day basis is something that's really important to me. Right. Uh, Jim. Um. I'll just echo some of what um, others have said here. Uh, I, you know, we, we really do count on the newsroom to, you know, set the agenda very often because they're bigger and they're, they're, they're out there uh, throughout the state and in Washington. Um, and in our neighboring states as well. And so, you know, we, we try to uh, often just sort of bounce off what they've reported and take our positions and editorial stances off of it. Um, but I do think that we, uh, and again, to echo what others have said here, I do think we can provide a little extra sort of um, thought-provoking um, uh, analysis of, of, of the news by, and, and, and sometimes that's aimed at like trying to persuade people to you know, support a particular policy, but sometimes I do think it, it can also just be um, a very sharp analytical take on something that provides a, a different way of thinking about something. And, 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 and I've encouraged our team to think about not necessarily just we have to have like a solution to everything. Sometimes we're just trying to help you understand or help you crystallize what's happening, but we're gonna do it from a point of view and we're gonna make clear what that point of view is. Um, I would just echo one other thing that folks at the API conference talked about that. Several people said this, and I thought it was really interesting, um, that they kind of go where the newsroom's not going, um, and they, they actually look for the, it's not necessarily, in, in an area that they think is important, that maybe is a resonant and significant uh, story that the newsroom isn't getting at. And um, I, I can't remember who was talking about this, but somebody was saying like they often do judicial, they cover judicial races because the newsroom is doing Congress and the president and you know the big uh, you know headline grabbing races, but nobody was looking at, at judges and and wh wow what a great what a great thought that was to me because um, so many important things happen at the judicial level um, you can say a lot of things about bigger issues by focusing on small races sometimes so that's an idea I'm going to take back actually with so that. Nancy that resonates with you oh I think I think the judicial um, uh, recommendations that we make are the most important recommendations that we do. Um, one, our readers really rely on them because the judicial candidates can't, cannot campaign. They cannot promise to be tough on crime. They can't, you know, they, they, they can't say, I'm gonna do this. They, all they can say is, I'm going to follow the law. And there are so many loons who are running for judge. No, 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 there are. Well, maybe it's the Miami effect. I don't know, but it's it can be really Lots scary. of Florida men and Florida women running Oh, yeah, judges. absolutely. It can be really scary, especially as the bench becomes more politicized in, in, in Florida. And again, we background, we, we check, we see, we try to hear sp their speeches to, you know, different forums. And um, it, it's, it's, it can be scary. I, I highly recommend doing judicial, judicial recommendations. 
It's what a, a public word. service. The, the it is. It is a really public incredible. service. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. Is that Just echoing, yeah, it's a public service. And for us, we found it's one of the deep, it resonates with our readers. We see those pieces being shared and page views and clicks really, really high um, during endorsement season. And I think it's to what you said, there's no one else doing it. Um, so that's part of the role, I think, for opinion is to provide that service to the city. Katie, yeah. did you have something to, uh, to add? Oh, no, um, but I was. Um, one of the things that we've done recently is we are now putting on the record all of our endorsement interviews, and we include transcripts mm -hmm. of each of those on our website. We annotate them. In some cases, we translate them. And what we have found is that, yes, people are reading our endorsement editorials, but they're actually really engaging with those transcripts, and sometimes they make news and it um, has been just an added layer to the endorsement process that I think has been very helpful. It's a really good yeah. idea. So um, going back to this relationship thing with the newsroom, what happens when what you're doing is in conflict or there's a perceived conflict uh, that journalists in the newsroom might have uh, with what you're publishing? Um, uh, there are, we know there are some examples at the New York Times, uh, um, uh, but uh, what about some of our other panelists? If not, we'll go to Katie. <laughs> Did you call on me? I think he's just he's, saying, he's, asking. Is there anyone else on the stage who's dealt with controversies oh. besides me? Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah, nothing that rises to that level, and nothing that <laughs> sorry, and nothing that that conflict with the newsroom. We don't that 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 that, that really hasn't happened. Same. It, you know. I. I, I haven't I haven't experienced anything at, at the at the Globe yet, but I you know I do you know I do meet um, with the executive editor of, of the Globe um, once a week, with is part of a bigger group, and um, you know that's a forum where sometimes concerns can come up a little bit, but there I have not yet seen anything, and it, where where it's happened, it's been you know just like you know you might consider looking at this story we did a little while ago just to give you extra context but th there's been not no uh, no blow up of the type um, other news organizations have had <laughs> so. so Katie how do you navigate that I mean I think that I actually think that, you know, obviously we have had some high profile controversies at the Times over the last five years since I came from the Globe. Um, and, you know, those are often very difficult. Um, and it goes back to what I was talking earlier about principles. So one thing that we talk a lot about in New York Times opinion is that every day we're gonna publish things that we agree with and that we disagree with. And I can say that very clearly for myself. Almost every single day there's a piece in our opinion section that I disagree with. Um, and because we see that as so clearly our mission uh, in opinion, we are able to navigate a lot of those controversies. Um, you know, we, Obviously, there are any, anyone who you can Google. There are plenty of uh, ways to find out about the controversies if you want. Um, but they actually are rarer than it sounds. We, we normally have a very cooperative, wonderful, respectful relationship with our newsroom colleagues. We do have occasionally, you know, those situations. And this is the case, actually, even though none of them will admit it, in every newsroom uh, opinion relationship, where there is, for instance, uh, a PR flack or a public figure or a politician who is unhappy about something the opinion section has done and goes to the beat reporter and complains about it. Um, and those, and normally, they just are sent our way. We have a you know brief conversation about it. And normally, I call the person and we work those things out. So you know, I think that that is part of the more um, regular interactions that we're having with our newsroom colleagues. And then, of course, we ha occasionally have bigger issues, and, and we work through them. Can I have one thing? Um, oh, just two quick thoughts. One is that um, having you know been witness to some of those controversies, it, it, it partly is a, at the times is a testament to like the, the power of that section because it gets so many readers. It's un, it's incredible, um, and so it's 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 hard to not notice the work that comes out of there, um, which is most of which is amazing. Um, and you know, and I think Katie's right that there's there's tensions that do exist, um, and it's possible that they don't surface as much at a at a place like the Boston Globe because 
were a smaller part of their readership. And, and that's just a, you know, that's something I'd like to change, but um, you know, it also means that probably they're not quite paying attention to us as much. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so at the uh, API Opinion Summit that just concluded, one of your colleagues said, uh, not everyone can write. It's such a narrow form of human experience. Uh, what new formats are you uh, exploring in opinion journalism? Uh, and what format should you be exploring that you haven't tried yet? Uh, Nancy? This is the time to introduce the thing, the podcast clip. Do oh, I get to do this? Do you get the clicker now? Do I get the clicker? Yeah. Yeah, the Miami Hero. Oh, yeah. This is Woke Wars, a podcast by the Miami Herald's opinion team, where we look behind Florida's culture wars. Welcome to Woke Wars. I am Isadora Ringel, and I'm joined today by Miami Herald opinion team members Nancy Ancrum and Amy Drisco. Today on this podcast, we will talk about Florida's war against woke corporation. There have been a lot of instances, let's let's not forget Nike and Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> Remember people saying they were going to burn their Nike apparel. So do you feel that corporations have become more political in that in that arena of public debate? I think this is corporate responsibility uh, 2.0. This is really not new. I remember the 60s and the 70s where people who were very concerned about air pollution, water pollution, pushed and pushed and pushed for, for corporate entities to stop, to stop doing it. And by and large, through, through law and policy, they have. We don't have a love canal. I think they still have to clean that thing up, but we don't have a love canal. You can, you can swim in more rivers than you, know, you could at the time. This is not new. It is just highly pitched. Uh, people are treating it, uh, the issues are very personal. Um, you know, anyone and everyone can come out for a clean river, but um, targeting LGBTQ, targeting DEI, which might help uh, people of color, women, to progress or access opportunity. It's much more uh, personal and uh, uh, mean-spirited this time around. Well, I think the governor does, does a really good job of framing issues for people. And uh, Often there are issues people didn't even realize that they had. So there's a, there's a bit of genius to that, where you know you you see something and you and you make it into an issue. And he's been doing that over and over. Um, I think many much of this woke training, there may be a little bit of a um, you know a little bit of a grain of truth that people are uncomfortable with some of these things, and and that they don't like being pushed beyond their comfort zone. Um, but sometimes that's also you know growth and progress and. Uh, he seems to be telling Floridians it's okay to push back and not do anything that people have asked asking you to do. And I think that's a little bit of a, um, you know, it's, it's sliding backwards. And that's something that this state really cannot afford, but that's where we're headed. That's great. So that's, Nancy, tell us a little bit about what we just That's talked. our podcast. Um, you know, we have our morning meetings. We have uh, really spirited conversations that zig this way and zag that way. And one day in December, I said, we ought to have a podcast. Mm. You know? <laughs> and so we have a podcast. But the beauty of this is it's, it's limited. It is pegged solely to the legislative session, which started at the beginning of March, and it will end in a few weeks. We're, we're using this as a branding uh, exercise we don't have anything to compare it to. I think, you know, looking at the numbers, we have a lot of people who are watching it or listening to it. It's both video and audio. But I don't have anything to, co to compare it to. And so we're not ready to continue this. It's a lot of work. Um, the, the back end was especially a lot of work, but the audience growth producer was great uh, in really getting this set up. Sitting down and, you know, talking among ourselves is, uh, the easy part. Our concern is that we all we all end up sounding pretty liberal. We do intersperse um, uh, audio of the governor or anyone else speaking in opposition of what we ultimately are saying. 
and we also bring some nuance. We don't all think alike. Uh, but again, once you get to consensus, we, we're looking pretty, you know, pretty liberal, and we really didn't want to turn off people by totally excluding opposition voices. What other new formats are uh, you all ex uh, exploring or considering? Zaybeth? Um, we really are traditional at this point, and I think that's partly a mechanism of the fact that we've had three people for a year, um, so this was really a bandwidth issue. Um, we are just in the moment of this expansion of our team, and I think that's as we were settling in, considering more opportunities for um, different alternative ways of reaching audience. But I, I agree with the comment from the API that you know, one of our big missions is to, to surface voices that reflect our, the Bay, um, and not everyone's going to come through the written word. So podcasts, video podcasts, op-eds, those all make a lot of sense. Uh, two things I wanted to mention from the API in, um, summit was the LA Times was showing, Terry from the LA Times was showing us video letters to the editor, which I thought was really interesting. Um, yeah, you know, really fantastic. It's, they're really well done, and they're not just the letter. They actually go behind the letter and talk to the, the person who wrote it mm -hmm. um, so that people can have an understanding of where this view is coming from and the story, the human story behind the person who wrote it. Um, just sort of increasing reach, increasing uh, signaling to the city that you know this is a platform for everyone, for all of you. Um, and I think that's a really powerful uh, example that folks might want to take a look at. I know I'm going to be pondering that as I return to the to the bay. Great, uh, Jim, you're uh, agreeing. I, yeah, I, I was really struck by what the LA Times has done. Um, it, it just it, and going to your original question, it's like a lot of people can't write. It's extraordinary how even you know really smart people, you know, academics and you know politicians more typically. Um, just can't write, and uh, you know, and then there's also the regular person who you, 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 they, they have a particular life experience that you would love to somehow get out there, um, but getting a, a written piece is hard. And so, the idea of doing videos, um, it, I think, is is got a lot of promise. The the thing is, the LA Times has a video team. We do not. So, we're 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 probably going to try to explore just Instagram Reels, short video takes. Things off cell phones, where you know we can we can grab um, letter writers or regular folks to to tell us in a very concise way something that we can put on video. I'll just add also that we are I, I see podcasts as the same way because like it, it's um, very often podcast guests are writers and they could they could write you an op-ed, but like a 30-minute conversation might bring out a lot of things that uh, don't come out in that op-ed, um, or you can talk sort of behind the story of the story and you can get ad added context. And so that's where we are pushing towards doing a podcast like that. It'll be um, a little bit different from um, Nancy's in that it'll be sort of a guest uh, guest with a, with a host in a conversation for 25 or 30 minutes. Um, and we're, uh, we're very excited about that. Okay, we'll hear from Katie and then we will begin taking questions from the audience. So if you want to start approaching the microphones, we'll do that after Katie uh, talks with us. Jim, I was uh, jealous to hear you guys already have a TikTok. <laughs> well, that was the, you know, that was bringing in a social media editor who's 23 and, uh, <laughs> under, and, and will keep us from embarrassing ourselves by doing our own TikToks, and she's good at it. So um, whether that is, a, you know, w whether <laughs> maybe TikTok gets banned or, <laughs> or it turns out it's just not a useful platform, who knows, but we're, we're trying it. Well, TikTok is the next frontier for New York Times opinion. Uh, stay tuned. Um, we're, we're only a few years late. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, we have expanded a great deal uh, in opinion at the Times, particularly when it comes to multimedia. We think of a lot of these efforts still um, as ways to find new audiences for our journalism. So for instance, we have built up um, a large, uh, I mean, large for the standards of the uh, stage, but um, uh, team of video um, producers and uh, makers. We have a legacy product in OpDocs that we built upon, but now we create our own original films. Um, and we see when we do that, that we, and you know, I have another slide, I'll spare you. <laughs> um, I think it is number 
eight. Um, but yes, we have been we've we've been experimenting a lot in terms of form. Sorry, excuse me. I'm supposed to be ex moving this. Uh, but we've been experimenting a lot with video, and actually, this is an entirely pre a big preview of all of the stuff that we are doing right now as we as I go through this. But this is a um, this is just a sample of the videos that we've done in opinion over the last year or so. We found that it's a way to bring voices, exactly as Michael points out, into our section that normally you wouldn't find. So for instance, Megan the Stallion did a, a video op-ed with us. Um, we've been able to use it to bring satire. Um, we have been able to do deeper, longer form projects with it. Um, and it's, it's actually been really fun, for one. Um, I know for myself, um, I did um, a little bit of video when I was at the Globe, but coming to the Times and being able to play with this form has been um, uh, very, very challenging. We've also been doing a variety of experiments um, where we are trying to bring several different kinds of voices to, and now this thing is just gonna play, so. Um, uh, into our pages, um, one of those efforts uh, has been a series of focus groups that we've done. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, well. Anyways, this is a different project. We've been using interactives um, in a variety of different ways. Um, so we've done focus groups where we've been talking to eight to ten people about their political views on a variety of subjects. This is a great project we did with our columnists last year. It was called I Was Wrong, and we had the columnists each write a piece about something that they'd been wrong about. It was incredibly popular. People just enjoyed you know, seeing our columnists talk um, and be humble about uh, their various opinions over the years. These are, maybe this will play now, this is our focus groups. Um, and this week we did one on aging, but we've done them on a whole variety of topics. The one you're seeing on the screen is a group of Asian Americans talking about their views. Um, we are doing simpler things, including in text, um, things like the conversation between Gail Collins and Brett Stevens every single week that is one of the most popular features that we do because it offers um, the ability to see Gail and Brett in conversation in a different way than um, their, just their columns. Um, and then um, we also have been building interactives. Uh, we, we just launched in March this incredible project from our graphics team uh, that allows you to basically, uh, well, sorry, slides aren't working, but it allows you essentially to um, put in a variety of different factors and see what college might be the best fit for you. Um, it's based off of all the conversations that we've been having in recent years about the, the value of college rankings and also their shortcomings, of course. And then finally, we've just rethought what being a columnist at the New York Times is. And so we've hired people like Ezra Klein, who um, is doing both, obviously, a written column, but he's also doing a podcast. We've made a lot of investments, generally, in podcasts in recent years. Um, we've brought Lulu Garcia Navarro in from NPR. Um, she does a great podcast called for First Person. Um, we've, you know, um, and we are later, just to give you a short, small preview, later this month about to announce that we have a new podcast um, that is uh, a conversation uh, with our opinion writers um, and uh, you can see a preview on it on our website right now. Um, I think there's uh, volume on this, but I'll spare you so that we can get to questions. Great. Uh, thank you all. So at this time, we would like to take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, so if you'd please approach one of the microphones. Well, let's see if we have... Oh, go Hi. Ahead. Hi. Uh, Christine Mehta, senior editor at Harvard Public Health. Um, so quick two-part question. So what I'm hearing across the board is that opinion is growing as part of a paper online operation. So I'm wondering from all of the panelists what role you think opinion, or one, what is driving the interest in growth in opinion, both from the paper uh, publisher side as well as the audience, and what role you think opinion plays in building an informed citizenry, say, as opposed to news analysis? 
Um, and then my second part question is specifically for Zeba. Uh, when you're building a small opinion operation from the ground floor, what have you seen that supports uh, reliable audience growth in terms of, say, columnists versus focusing on uh, soliciting guest essays and kind of relying on outside uh, voices, outside of your opinion internal operation? Zeba, do you want to take that first? Uh, I want to think about it if someone else wants to go first. Okay. Um, the question about opinion growing and why, I think, I think it's because these days, as opposed to 50 years ago, 100 years ago, everyone is an opinion writer. Everyone has an opinion. And we need to be in there pitching with the blogs and the blogs and the, you know, you name it. I think it has, it's kind of like, you know, you want your restaurant to be on a busy street of other restaurants um, where, you know, a lot, of, a lot of foot traffic as opposed to, you know, in the warehouse district. I, I think it's something like that. I think, I think that people are interested in being challenged, interested in challenging opinion writers and opinion makers. And again, we are in the mix and people are interested in what, not necessarily in agreement, but interested in what we have to say. Uh, Jim? I was just gonna say, it's not growing everywhere. There, as we learned at the API uh, Summit, uh, there's a lot of places that no longer do endorsements. They've had their opinion sections cut. Um, the New York Times notwithstanding. I mean, there, it's, there, there's a lot of places where it just doesn't even, it barely exists. There's essentially letters sections. So. Um, I do think that, um, you know, speaking for the Boston Globe, for instance, I think our ownership feels like opinion is a crucial part of sort of the civic mission of the, of the, of the organization and that taking positions on policies is, is, is critical for that. Um, but not, that doesn't exist everywhere. If I could just add, McClatchy expects opinion to raise revenue, to, to, to increase readership, um, and subscriptions, and to raise revenue. That's another mission that's driving us. Great, uh, Zeba? Um, so I'll try to get both of those. So to the first one, I think the distinguishing thing I think that opinion can do, at least with our paper, is a lot of first person narrative, driving ideas. Um, I think that's more engaging for some readership, and so that's why they keep coming back and sharing those pieces because it touches on a human connection, on a bigger idea that may be backed by, I mean, it will be backed by data and, and evidence, but the, the vehicle is that narrative, and that can be quite powerful. Um, I think in terms of bringing, what was the question about growth? You had said growing a team. Yeah, in terms of the structure of your team, columnists versus, say, soliciting exclusively guest essays, you know, what do you see building audience engagement and loyalty? I think both in different ways, and so, and, and even also endorsements. Like, I think in California, you know, our bureaucracy is, is legendary, um, and so I remember one of the, during endorsement season, um, and we didn't actually make an endorsement on a very unique issue called the Board of Equalization in California, and it's our tax board, and it's crazy. Um, and uh, we basically said that. We said, let's just get rid of it. We're not endorsing anyone. And we said, here's why. Um, and we went through, there had been reforms, and when we followed up with reporting to show that it hadn't improved at all um, and that much of the work had been transferred out. And the response was, not only was that shared many times over, but in the comments section, a lot of, you know, for once, I agree with the Chronicle. Like, a lot of sort of, like, you know, not doing just doing the norm because you're supposed to pick a side, but actually just call going to the root of the issue. I think people are looking for solutions um, and being honest about that. That also, I know that particular piece led to a lot of conversions for subscriptions for us. So I think it's building that trust in the public that can lead to that. I think similarly with columnists and, and um, external contributors, if you can uh, I'm thinking of one piece by one of our columnists who it's not only being very transparent and honest about what's at stake and what's going on, but also being on top of the hyper-local news. So there was an incident of somebody, um, I think a, an art gallery owner, hosing a homeless person. And that went viral on, on TikTok and Twitter. And, um, you know, because we're local, because this, this columnist knows, knows everyone in, in, in the area, she's able to go down there and, and talk to people. Um, and really pull the story out that wasn't necessarily being shared in the quick viral tweets that everyone had. So that's 
a value add that people really appreciate. Um, and then similar to, to external contributors, I think it's about, and this is a larger question about representation and voice, making sure you're reaching out to every different, as much as you can to the different pockets because you're indicating for a, a city that historically, and this is true in many places, didn't talk to everyone and wasn't talking to everyone. So if you go out and you meet people from those places and engage them, and sometimes it takes more work potentially, it, A is trust, but then to the earlier question about not everyone's a writer, working really intensely with someone, that's a return on investment I think goes beyond the individual contributing piece. Um, it, it signals a larger message to that demographic in society. It potentially will increase your op-eds, but there are ripple effects in terms of what we do when you do that extra work. Um, that translates into subscriptions and loyalty. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Zeba. So unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, we'll take one quick question uh, from online uh, that uh, will uh, be an interesting way to wrap things up. Uh, that question is, would you say opinion journalism is still dominated by white men? <laughs> white men. I, I don't know. I mean, no, really, I, I don't know. I know that we're, um, my board is all women, um, not done by intention. Um, we get pushed back for that, which I understand. Um, but I, you know, of the boards, of, of the newspapers that I read, if it is still dominated by white men, I'm not going to be, I'm not surprised at all. But I think that um, at least the larger papers have done a pretty good job of diversifying. In, in many ways. Great, thank you. Uh, Katie? Yeah, I actually, I, I agree with Nancy that I don't have the exact statistics mm -hmm. to back up what I'm about to say, but I do think that um, everyone on the stage especially, um, but really our colleagues across the board uh, in opinion operations have made a very concerted effort in recent years to offer a wider breadth of perspectives um, expertise, lived experience, and a lot of that um, is around, uh, you know, gender and race um, diversification as well as ideological diversification. And so, you know, we've done that very specifically at the New York Times. I think that if you looked at our columnists lineup today versus um, just a few years ago, we have done things like brought in Carlos Lozada from the Washington Post, who was our first Latino columnist who I hired in September. We have um, now uh, Lydia Polgreen, who is writing about international affairs, um, Tressie Cottom, who's writing about um, cultural issues. We have done a ton of work, started under Jim's leadership in our op-ed section as to making sure that we are doing a better job of having that gender balance. Uh, as well as racial diversity and, uh, again, ideological diversity in our pages. And then the other thing that we've been doing, um, and then I, I'll pass it off, uh, is t we have started to, you know, politics, foreign policy um, are always going to be the bread and butter of the New York Times opinion section. It's often what people come to our section to read about. But we are increasingly doing more and more pieces on topics across a, um, a wider variety of areas, things like business and technology, culture issues, uh, health and science, um, you know, and in our efforts to do that, um, we are seeing that we are getting more and more audiences who might not necessarily come to us to read our Trump coverage or, um, you know, about um, US-China relations or, or whatever the more um, serious topic is, but they are very happy to come and discuss what being middle-aged in 2023 means. Um, and, and that also goes to some of the forms that we've been experimenting with. Zeba, you have um, a closing a thought? Just, uh, so the organization that I was in, uh, affiliated with prior to this role a few years ago was called the Op-Ed Project. It's still around, and they had done some research. I think they partnered with MIT. This was in 2014, 2015, and at the time, I think what they had found was like, in terms of women's representation around, I forget the number, but it was definitely under 20%. I mean, it was probably less. 
Um, I recently was reconnected with them to ask, you know, if there was latest numbers. They said they were working on something, um, but they hadn't been released yet. But they had suspected they wouldn't be surprised if women's representation was as had doubled to, you know, 30 or around there. So, but that's not uh, definitive. That's something that they haven't released. That's just conjecture. But they think that's where it's headed. And we have these four great editors who are all working on uh, making opinion more diverse and bringing in uh, more people. So let's thank them for joining us today and for answering these wonderful questions.